بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم good afternoon everyone uh, in the few coming 50 minutes or so inshallah I'll be uh, sharing with you my experience with dry eye patients actually I have interest special interest in dry eyes which started long back when I worked with Professor Tabara in the eye clinics at King Khalid University Hospital and since then I have a dry eye clinic which is uh, running for years. This was uh, one of the first works we have done together in 1994 on Lubrithal, which is a carbamyl gel, comparing it with polyvinyl alcohol, which is liquefied tears for the residence time, preocular residence time, and comparing patients with healthy individuals. This is the King Khalid University Hospital with the building on the right side for the clinics there. And actually the clinics at King Khalid University Hospital has an advantage. You know, it's a general hospital, tertiary care, and it has all the specialties. And we used to have referrals from medicine, surgery, pediatric, rheumatology, dermatology, and so on. So we, so we see different varieties of diseases there. Also, we see cases in the early acute condition. We have seen Stephen Johnson syndrome in the acute phase. Maybe you'll not see it in elsewhere, but we used to see it in the acute stage. Dry eye is a common problem in Saudi Arabia. Although it's uh, common, there isn't really a nationwide study or survey which was con uh, conducted to show the magnitude and the causes of the problem. There was only localized studies done in regions, like this study done by Dr. Bukhari in Jeddah, where they have seen about uh, 250 patients or 253 pa uh, individuals, normal individuals, attending the patients coming for the clinic. And they tried to see how many of these, although they didn't come and they did not complain of any dry eyes, how many of these will have dry eyes. And they found a prevalence of 93.2% of these normal individuals having dry eyes. And to diagnose dry eyes, he should have at least one symptom or more and should have at least one sign or more. So you cannot diagnose it on only one test or one complaint. The definition of dry eyes. The dry eye workshop is a group of researchers, scientists, and clinicians internationally working to, to define dry eyes, classify it, and to see the causes. And their work internationally took about 10 years or more. They started in 1994, and they reported their final report in 2007. And the definition of dry eyes in uh, this report was, it's a disease which affects the tears and ocular surface and associated with symptoms of discomfort, visual disturbance, and ocular inflammation with potential for uh, ocular damage, so surface, ocular surface damage, and may be associated with increased osmolarity of tears and inflammation of the ocular surface. As we see, it's a multifactorial disease. So there are many factors which play a, play a role for dry eyes, multifactorial disease. As we go through in this talk, we'll see that the causes for dry eyes have changed over time. And there's new factors which play a, play a role for dry eyes and there's also attention and awareness of some new diseases which are more serious for dry eyes. 
and also we have to give attention to environmental factors. Before we proceed, we should realize the function of tears so we can feel about what the patient may suffer from when he has dry eyes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created our eyes and provided the eyes with protective measures. And the tear film is one of the first lines of defense for this eye. As we know, the eye is exposed to the environment. We can have dust, can have evaporates, toxic material, anything reaching the eyes. So the tears will wash it out, dilute it, and wash it out to protect the eye. In addition, we know that the corneal surface, if we look at it under the electron microscope, it's not smooth. It's rough, irregular. And it's made smooth by the pre-corneal tear film, which is important to reflect the rays reaching the cornea precisely and the macula. In addition, the lids are moving on the eye all the time. And you can imagine if there's no lubrication, how will the ocular surface suffer from this friction, which will cause inflammation. In addition, the tear film is important for the healthiness of the epithelial cells and corneal surface. Also, it contains bactericidal elements like beta lysine, lactoferrin, immunoglobulins, and others which protect the cornea against infection. So in general, we, we can think about these factors are these important functions of tears. So the patient with dry eyes, if they lose these functions, they can suffer from blurring of vision, they are at risk of infection, they may complain of chronic inflammation because of the less tears for lubrication needed, and so on. And when we speak about dry eyes, it may affect any of the three layers that we know, the mucinous layer, the aqueous layer, and the lipid layer. We know that the main function of tears is brought about by the aqueous layer, which has the constituents important for nutrition and metabolism and so on. But the other layers are also very important for the stability and to minimize the evaporation of tears. So mucus converts the cornea from being hydrophobic, which will not accept aqueous on it, to hydrophilic. So it's important for the stability. It's produced by the goblet cells. The lipid layer is important for minimizing the evaporation of this aqueous layer, which is the main bulk of the tears. So if we have defect in any of these layers, we'll have a picture of dry eyes. So in addition, actually, we have the importance of the lids, which distribute the tears. So the lid is important for distribution of the tears, getting rid of the old tears, which is pumped out, and new tears will be coming. So dry eyes could be associated with aqueous deficiency, mucus deficiency, lipid deficiency, and also lid surfacing abnormalities. And when we have epitheliopathy, this will affect also the tear film for its uh, stability. Aqueous tear deficiency, keratoconjuvitis sicca, is the major part of dry eye cases. It could be caused by congenital uh, causes like Riley Day syndrome, although it's rare. I've only seen maybe one or two cases. And it could be caused by inflammation, infection, trauma to the lacrimal glands, and hyposecretion related to neuroparalytic causes, and could be caused by Sjogren syndrome. Lid surfacing, as I mentioned, is important, and if we don't have the normal lid surfacing, we'll have a picture of dry eyes. For example, if you don't have complete closure or you have facial palsy, you can have exposure keratitis. If you have symbolifer, the lid movement will not be appropriate, and you can have a picture of 
dry eyes. If you have coloboma of the lids, you can have picture of dry eyes. If you have less frequent blinking, which is important for the distribution of tear, you can have picture of dry eyes, and so on. What are the common symptoms? These are the most common symptoms the patient will complain of, foreign body sensation, burning sensation, and eye fatigue. Regarding clinical assessment, we usually do the Shermer test, slit lamp examination, tear breakup time, and staining of the cornea and conjunctiva. The signs we look for at the slit lamp, we look at the tear meniscus, which is usually about one millimeter. If it's less, you know that there's something wrong with the tear film. We look for, if we see debris, usually the healthy eye, the tears will wash anything reaching the eye. So if you see debris in the tear film, you know that this patient has something wrong with his tear function. Also, if you see tear uh, mucus strands or filaments, these are all signs of dry eyes. It's important to mention here that there's no one test which is definite to diagnose dry eyes. So if you have Shermer very low, you cannot say that the patient has dry eyes. You should have combination of tests. And as I mentioned before, to diagnose dry eyes, you, ha you should have at least one symptom or more and one sign or more. But you cannot rely on one test. What you see in this slide, look at the tear meniscus here. You see that's scanty and interrupted. And you can have it even absent in some very severe dry eye cases. This is mucus strand. Usually you shouldn't see it in the healthy eye. Filaments. Okay. So there have been changes in the causes in dry eyes. And I'd like to take you on a trip with dry eye to see the past and the future of dry eyes. Trachoma used to be a common ocular problem seen in Saudi Arabia with multiple ocular morbidity, including dry eyes. And this study done by Dr. Professor Tabara and co-workers in 1986, about 30 years back, has shown that trachoma was the second cause of blindness in Saudi Arabia. The first was cataracts. So trachoma was about 10.5% as causes of blindness. And the blindness, as we'll see, is related to the corneal scarring caused by trachoma. And part of the disease also we have dry eyes, especially in these advanced conditions. Trachoma is a chronic infectious keratoconjunctivitis caused by chlamydia trachomatis and used to be cause blindness secondary to corneal scarring, as we mentioned. As you know, trachoma is a psychiatrizing disease, which leads to scarring, subepithelial scarring. So it will lead to trachiasis, entropion, corneal scarring, uh, goblet cell damage, obstruction of the gland ducts, obliteration of the meibomian orifices. So you can imagine from this that trachoma will affect all the three layers of the tear film. With the obstruction of the ducts, you'll have absence or diminished aqueous. And with the damage to the mucus, to the goblet cells, we have absence of mucus. And obliteration of the meibomian orifices will have reduction or absence of the oily layer. This is the normal conjunctiva, as you see it. When you invert the upper lid, you can see the vessels running vertically. With trachoma, you may have follicles, as you see here, with papillary hypertrophy or edema of the conjunctiva, and you have absence of the normal vessels that you usually see. You can have more follicles, as you see. And these follicles usually end up in scarring. And the inflammation 
may be so severe that it may obscure the follicles. So the patient may have follicles, but it's obscured by the intense inflammation. And uh, later on, you can see concretions, which are signs of chronic uh, conjunctivitis. The scarring may vary. You can have mild, severe, and this will lead to trachiasis, as we've said. You can see the trachiotic clashes there. Entropion, and the lashes rubbing on the cornea, causing damage. And actually, you can have dystichiasis, another row of lashes apart from the original. And the scarring will progress. You can have mild, more intense scarring. And you can see this picture. Actually, we used to see these pictures of advanced blinding trachoma. Because nowadays they speak about non-blinding trachoma, which are seen. So we used to see a lot of these before, when the trachoma was common. And this is the herpet spits that you see in the upper panas. And this is pathognomonic for trachoma. So once you see these, you know that the patient had trachoma. I'll just show you some of the examples of trachoma that we see nowadays in the clinics. This is a 63 years old female. The right eye, you see the degree of entropion. The lashes pointing forward. This is the tarsal conjunctiva with few scars and concretions. And the cornea superior, you see the panis. This is the other eye. Again, with scarring, concretions. And you can see the panis here. But the center of the cornea is clear, as you've seen. So most of the cases, we don't have the nine blinding. And actually, they are old age. We don't see it in the younger age group in the 20s or 30s. This is another case, 56 years old female. The right eye with a degree of entropion, the conjunctiva, the panis, with staining only a few punctate keratitis, the other eye. And you can see the panis here with the herpes spits. But the cornea is clear. This is the third case, 71 years old male. You see the degree of entropion, the scarring in the tarsal conjunctiva, which is marked. And the panis, the center of the cornea is clear. OK. so. As we've seen, trachoma used to be seen with full picture, advanced stages with scarring and dry eyes. But nowadays, we don't see it in that full picture. We see it, we see the non-blinding trachoma, and they are in inactive stage. Maybe every now and then, a uh, few years back, you may have seen some uh, active conditions. Now we'll proceed to see other cases. So if we say that this is the trachoma before, there are other factors behind that we want to see. Sjogren's syndrome. Sjogren's syndrome is a chronic, slowly progressive autoimmune disease of unknown cause. It's characterized by the lymphoid infiltration of the exocrine glands, in particular the lacrimal gland and the salivary gland. So this is a histopathology where you can see the infiltration of the lymphocytes. And this infiltration will cause damage to the gland, but you have still some healthy assignment. There was fairly uh, a new attention to Sjogren's syndrome within the last maybe two decades, and there has been special clinics, institutes, websites, foundations, and so, and so on, caring for Sjogren syndrome as being a serious uh, syndrome affecting the community. The incidence of Sjogren syndrome is from 1 to 2% of the population in the United States. 
So it's not uncommon. And affects females more than males. And the females are about 95% of the cases. And usually the age ranges from 40 to 60. But it could also affect younger age group. We have the primary and secondary shogun. The primary, where you have dry eyes, dry mouth, and secondary, aso this complex associated with systemic disease, connective tissue disease like rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, polyarthritis nodosa, and others. It's important here to know that dry eyes in Sjogren syndrome does not mean that the gland is totally destructed. But there may be remnants of normal tissue which is not functioning because it's suppressed by the inflammatory products. And this is the theme behind giving anti-inflammatory drugs to improve the tear production, like cyclosporine, tacrolimus, and others. So when you suppress the inflammation, the remaining healthy parts of the gland will produce more tears and you can overcome the problem. It's also important to know that patients with Sjogren's syndrome may suffer from uh, peripheral neuropathy. And we have seen a lot of these coming with the advanced stages with diffuse erosions, yet they are not complaining. They are not in severe pain. And this may be part of the, the poor compliance and the advance in the problem. So Sjogren syndrome is difficult to diagnose because it's, uh, it has a lot of symptoms and signs which do not show at the same time and they usually are treated individually. And you can miss the disease as it could be also uh, similar to other conditions. So the differential, you have others which may cause the same symptoms and signs. Usually with uh, Sjogren's syndrome patients, we can find zero Schirmer test. Many of them we see zero Schirmer test are very low, be below five when they have the condition. And this is an example of the picture of the cornea which we see with Sjogren's syndrome, diffuse erosions, uh, even ulceration. So Sjogren's syndrome is not uncommon Although it can, uh, although it is, it involves, uh, it, uh, it may cause serious, it's slowly progressive. The disease is slowly progressive, but yet it is serious and may cause serious complications like lymphoid infiltration, even lymphoma. And uh, as I mentioned, it's usually associated with severe dry eyes that resist treatment. So if you have patients, different uh, causes, and you treat them, and you treat Sjogren's syndrome patients, the others may respond to your medication, but Sjogren's syndrome will consist, continue with the severe dry eyes. Whether you put plugs, you uh, treat with frequent lubrication, give anti-inflammatory and so on, they still suffer a lot. Okay. I'll give you another example of diseases that we should be uh, aware of that may cause dry eyes. Acne rosacea. Acne rosacea is common in United States and Europe. And female are affected more than male again with about double the number two to one. And the age ranges from 30 to 60. Uh, 
and usually affects the fair color people. So in dark color people, it's not quite common. This is a picture of a patient with rosacea. You can see the erythema with telangiectasia on the cheeks. There are three subtypes. You have the erythematous telangiectatic rosacea. We have the papillobustular, and we have the phycomatous with the rhinophyma. This is the first type, erythematotelangiectatic. This is with the papillopastular, and this is the rhinophyma in the third sub-type. Sub the cause of rosacea is not known, but it is triggered by many factors, including uh, temperature high or low temperature, sun exposure, also with uh, spicy food, alcohol, stress, these may all aggravate and trigger the condition. It's diagnosed by the clinical picture and the history taken. Although originally it's a skin disorder, but it may affect the eye. And the reports mentioned that it affects the eye between 3% up to 58%, according to different reports. It may affect the lids, the conjunctiva, the cornea. And the lids may show irregularity, telangiectasia at the lid margin. You can have calasian. You can have meibomian gland dysfunction. And the conjunctiva, you can have hyperemia, you can have dry eyes. And the cornea is the sight-threatening part. And you can see new vascularization, uh, stromal keratitis, erosions, uh, thinning, and even ulceration or perforation. Episclera and scler episcleritis and sclerosis, there have been reported, but they are rare. We conducted a study uh, with uh, dermatology clinic and with Dr. Amal Balbisi, which is associate professor at the Department of Dermatology in the university. And they used to diagnose the patients. The patients diagnosed with uh, acne rosacea were referred to the eye clinic with a flow sheet to check for presence of ocular findings and dry eyes and to see the symptoms. This is the flow sheet, where, which has personal information, clinical findings, and also uh, the symptoms are recorded. We have seen about 53 patients. 52 of them were, male, were female, and one was uh, male. And out of these, we found that the ocular involvement was quite high, 79.2% of the acne rosacea patient had ocular involvement. Where it was recorded 3 to 58 elsewhere. And the major findings of ocular rosacea was meibomian gland dysfunction, dry eyes, lid telangiectasia, bilifaritis, and illegal lead margin, plus others. And you see the frequency of each. But as you can see here, we didn't see really sight threatening conditions. No new vascularization of the cornea, no stromal keratitis, no melting, no perforation, so on. So the form we have seen represents mild ocular findings with ocularization. You can see here the meibom gland dysfunction. Look at the lid margin. Irregularity of the lid margin. Here we can see irregularity with telangiectasia. You see the fine vessels. And here you see the telangiectasia on the lid margin. So 
So ocular rosacea is fairly common. So patients with acne rosacea will present with ocular rosacea, as we mentioned, with a high frequency in our population. Uh, all our patients presented with the mild form. We then see the uh, uh, sight threatening. And the common ocular findings we've seen is meibomian gland dysfunction, telangiectasia, irregular lids, and dry eyes. So dry eyes is part of the rosacea disease. So it is advocated that patients with acne rosacea should be referred to the ophthalmologist to rule out ocular finding because it can be overcome and missed. There's another disease which is quite common in our community that is diabetes mellitus. And actually the reports mentioned that we have about 25% of diabetes in our community. And recently even they say it's more, it's about 30%. So out of every three you may find one with uh, diabetes. And diabetes mellitus have been shown to be associated with dry eyes. And they think the cause behind it is related to the microvascular changes that affect the nerves, the corneal nerves, and may lead to hyposecretion of aqueous tears. So we should try to pay attention to these patients nowadays. Usually we used to check for other causes, but diabetes was not considered with many ophthalmologists that it may be a cause. So may, you may put in your history while uh, seeing a patient, whether he has diabetes or not. And sometimes you find patients with dry eye picture with no unknown cause, and he may be diabetic. So back to the dry eye clinic at King Khalid University Hospital. Uh, I collected a sample of 156 patients, new patients seen within the last few years, analyzed the result to see what we can find. So out of these, The females were a uh, majority compared to the males. The males were about 18% and the females 82%. And the mean age was 50.1 years. And when we looked at the major causes, number one, Sjogren, trachoma, second, rosacea, and meibomian gland dysfunction in the order th that you see. And there was combination of these together, trachoma with Sjogren, rosacea with meibomian gland dysfunction, and so on. And there were other uh, causes like blepharitis, exposure keratitis, uh, thyroid disease, pemphigus vulgaris, Steven Johnson syndrome, and others. So this pie will show the proportion of each. And we looked at the gender. As you see here, in all the categories, females are more than males, particularly in Sjogren syndrome. As we mentioned before, that about 95% of the Sjogren patients are female. And also in rosacea, it affects female more. And uh, the others also, trachoma and the others, have shown that the percentage of female is more than male. When we looked at the severity, the severity here is in green. So, so the most severe cases we found with Sjogren syndrome and with uh, rosacea and ibomoglion dysfunction, we didn't have really severe cases. And trachoma, only a few cases with severe dry eyes. And looking at the age, the mean age for trachoma was 57, for Sjogren about 50, and the rosacea about 42. So the trachoma cases that we see are mainly old age, and we don't see really young age group in the second or third degree. 
Something we should put in mind also as factors behind dry eyes, medications. And there's a group of medications that may cause dryness, including antihypertensive drugs, uh, especially beta blockers, anti, uh, antihistamine drugs, anti-Parkinson's drops, anti-depression drops, uh, anti-depression uh, medications, and anti-Parkinson's uh, medications, birth pills, and others. Okay, what about new factors? Now, when we spoke about trachoma, we spoke about uh, poverty, we spoke about hygiene, we spoke about other things. But even in our community nowadays with civilization, we have new factors leading to dry eyes. For example, this is a gentleman working in an office. What are the factors he has here that may lead to dry eyes? We have two factors. The air condition is one. The computer use. Now, prolonged use of computer is reported to cause reduced blinking. Because when you are concentrating, the frequency of blink comes down. So if we have the normal blink from 10 to 14 per minute, when you concentrate on the computer, you blink only three or four times per minute. And this will le lead to a dryness of the ocular surface. And with prolonged use, you can have picture of dry eyes. And we have seen some of our patients, we didn't find any other cause, but they say that they work on computers, say, for five, six hours per day. So the computer, when you concentrate, blinking is this. Another important factor, which you can put in your education to the patient, the level of the screen. The screen should be below the visual axis. It should not be at the same level, it should be low. As you look up, the palpebral fissure will be wider, and the chance for the pre tear film will dry faster. So the screen should be below the visual axis, not at the same level. Another factor, as you mentioned, the air condition. Actually, the air conditions nowadays dries the air. So it's the opposite of the old, the old conditions that we used to have. These act these uh, desert condition, air conditions actually acts as a humidifier. It pumps out air with water. You know, there's a pump to put water on the sides through this tissue. The, pool, the air will be pushed inside with this water as a humidifier. But the normal ferion air conditions, they, have, they dry the air and they have hose to connect it to the drain so the water they collect will go to the drain. That's why patients with severe dry eyes, they may suffer if they use rooms air conditioned. Another factor, contact lens use. Prolonged contact lens use is risk for dry eyes, as we see in some of the studies, as in this study. It's shown that you can have meibomian gland atrophy with a prolonged use of contact lens. On the other hand, uh, contact lens where they have faster evaporation of tear. So tear evaporation is more with contact lens where refractive surgery, which is quite common nowadays, also is a risk factor. And we all know that usually in uh, post-refractive surgery, one of the main complication is dry eyes. And it's related to the uh, risk to the peripheral corneal nerves. As you do that, for example, LASIK, you cut the peripheral ends of the corneal nerves, and the patient will suffer for dryness from three to six months till he comes back to normal with the healing of the corneal nerves. But sometimes you see some patients continue with dry eyes after six months, after one year, or even more and there is a sort of chronic dry eyes in some cases. And the other study here actually reports chronic dry eyes in PRK and LASIK. 
and they postulate that the chronic dry eyes post refractive surgery is related to patient used to have dry eyes before the refractive surgery. So these patients who have even um, a form of mild dry eyes before surgery, they are more likely to continue with dry eyes post-surgery, more than six months and so on. Another factor, the lid liner. So the chronic use of lid liners may lead to chronic inflammation and change in the tear film with time, as reported by some studies. So the long use of mascara is a risk for dry eyes. Smoking. Smoking is another factor, as smoke will cause irritation and will lead to chronic inflammation and the person may suffer from dry eyes. Environmental factors, dry weather, as in uh, areas like, for example, Riyadh compared to other areas on the sea, Jeddah or Dammam, the weather itself, the less humid and dry weather is important as a risk factor. Also the temperature. So high temp grades of temperature are risk factors for dry ice. And this is a study which they showed that ambient temperature has to do with the uh, tear film and dryness. So as we've seen, although we are uh, happy to get rid of some of the important causes of dry eyes in the past, like trachoma, with the strategic plans and with the availability of education and uh, uh, availability of simple treatment to control the disease. Now we are having a lot of factors playing a role. And as, we've, uh, as we spoke before, we can divide them mainly into categories, aqueous deficiency and evaporative in addition to the other ex, uh, external factors and medications. So in conclusion, dry eye disease is a common yet uh, frequently under-recognized condition and under-diagnosed. Causes are changing with time. Awareness of diseases and conditions that may lead to dry eyes and early management may control, control uh, or eradicate or minimize the severity of dry eyes. And part of the physician's role, not just to treat the patient, part of your role is to educate your patient for the different inf uh, important information that he needs. So a patient with severe dry eyes, if he's in an area where he's using a lot, uh, a lot uh, spending a lot of time in front of the computer, you should advise him for how to use it and try to use humidifier. And if he's in air conditioned area, and so on. So you have to give him the education which he needs to overcome the problem and at least to minimize the risk for uh, severe dry eyes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mansouri, for your uh, informative uh, ground round lectures and uh, like to open the floor for questions. By the way, regarding the, uh, the study you quoted uh, first uh, in the beginning of your talk, the one which is done by uh, Dr. Amal Bukhari and uh, Mr. Gab, it seems to be that they are in Western which I, I mean, uh, region and they, they, have, uh, they are near to, uh, they, they have the humid uh, environment. Mm -hmm. And they were surprised to have almost 93% uh, uh, people that who came mm -hmm. to the clinic uh, Complaint of dryness. I agree. If they have 93, we'll have 100 percent here. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. From your experience, what kind of medication you would recommend? Uh, you know, in the market, maybe around 100 uh, types of uh, 
cadmium toxin or, or olefin or just uh, what do you experience? Which one suits most of the patients? Because some patients they are not happy with our you're, you're right. First of all, the the thing which we will all agree upon, especially in moderate and severe dryness, you use preservative free. So you shouldn't use drops with preservative, as they will be concentrated in affectation. Regarding the different types, actually, I tried maybe all the types available in the farm and the market. There isn't really very much difference, and you can find even with the good ones some patients will complain and will not tolerate this type but will, but will tolerate the other type. So I don't think, but what I found that may work well, Sistine Ultra and uh, Optif maybe is working fine. But there isn't really very big difference between all of them. But it has to do with the compliance really. Many patients, like they come to the clinic, I ask them, how are you using your medication? They say, I'm using once, twice per day. I tell them to use it two hourly, and they come, they are using once or twice. And as I told you, these uh, patients with Sjogren's syndrome, they usually have peripheral neuropathy, and they will come with this picture, which I showed you with the diffuse erosions, yet they are not complaining. So this will not push them to be keen to use it. They mainly complain of, I have blurring of vision. I'm not happy with the vision of this uh, discomfort and so on, but they will not have that severe pain, which goes with the picture that you see. I'd like to hear from those who have experience to tell me their experience. Some patients nowadays using PTY yeah, they came to the university hospital actually, and uh, the science, uh, they have something to put on the eye which warms and the massage to the lids and so on. Actually, you can do it without this machine. What we do, this is good for mobile gland dysfunction where you have uh, dryness, sebum, uh, uh, dryness of the secretion in the orifice and so on. So you can warm the eye with hot compresses and do massage to the lower lid, pushing from down up and the upper lid from up down to clear the uh, meubomin gland ductules and clear it. So you can do it manually. They may help in those who have uh, meubomin gland dysfunction related to the dryness of the secretion in the ductules. And sometimes you might need to squeeze uh, the meubomin uh, glands because of the, th uh, the thick lid that there are a lot of myobomic glands which are uh, uh, full with 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 uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, oily uh, materials. So when you sometimes you find there are like dots like on the orifices of mm. the uh, myobomic gland orifices. Mm. Just if you if you just as I mentioned that Squeeze. you might try uh, uh, compresses or massage, but sometimes you might need to have two Q-tips and just try to press it and it will come like uh, paste, like paste. This, mm -hmm. this, I have seen it in some patients, they are, they are happy about it because they have done. And but they may get rid, the, they may come back with the dry secretion. So they can do it for several times. That, over that's true. Yeah. Uh, regarding, uh, I think, uh, is there any, any regard from your review of the literature, is there any surgical intervention to help? Dry eyes? Dry eyes. In the, you know, in the past, they tried the parotid gland, but it doesn't that work because, the, because, yeah. And the, nowadays, there's nothing. I don't know of any. Because the tears are totally different than saliva. And even the lubricants that we give, they are not as good as the normal tears. We use punctal occlusion. And uh, you can do it even for the, all the four puncta. You can... Previously, we used to do cautery, but nowadays you don't have to do the cautery because the uh, plugs will do the job. You give frequent lubrication. You give anti-inflammatory drugs. But even though some patients don't respond well. Okay. And you know that uh, in lubrication, the, the aqueous lubrication, 
doesn't remain for a long time. As the study I showed before, the gel will remain for a longer time. So the patients with more severe dryness, it's better to use uh, gel or to use uh, even ointment frequently. But they don't like the ointment in the morning because it causes blurring of vision. But from the protecting point of view, it remains for a longer time and protects the epithelium more than the tears, the aqueous tears. Okay, if there's no more question, I have one comment. I think uh, what Dr. Mansouri mentioned that at his conclusion, the last point, I think it's very important because if you educate the patient and tell him what is his problem, he should understand his disease. If he understands this, he will help in sure. accommodating himself to his status and he will be relieved more by using any medication you give. But if he's not understanding his problem, he thinks that your, your drops which are given to him, it will cure him, which is not true. It is a supportive measure. But he, if he understands that this is a chronic problem and he has to, to accommodate himself, he has to, to, to live with it, I'm sure he, he will be happy and he might have a certain etiquette or certain style in his life uh, when he uses a computer, when he is reading, when he is whatever he's doing. If he knows his problem, I think this will help. Uh, so education is very important. Uh, it will help more than the treatment. Just a small point for your interest. Uh, you know, in normal population, when you ask them, when do you, uh, does your eyes uh, tear? They say, when I cry, when I'm emotionally stressed and so on. As I mentioned, the tears are important for the protection of the eye. And it's there for 24 hours. And when you cry or you have emotional stress, what happens is like a fluid, right? Excessive production of tears that could not be accommodated by the drainage system, so it goes out. And this meaning is precisely mentioned in Quran. In the phrase, وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ تَرَى أَعْيُنَهُمْ تَفِيضُ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ إِمَّا عَرَفُوا مِنَ الْحَقِّ so what you have when you cry is a flood, tafidu min al dam. Yeah, and this is precise. Uh, okay, if there is no more question. Thank you very much, Dr. Mansouri, and uh, thank you for your uh, participation and your listening. Thank you. Thank you.